This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. This is a time to turn and to return. All real change begins with repentance. 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 Nothing will change until you do. Nothing will change until your attitude does. Nothing will change until you confess that God, I need you, I need you. Lord, wash me, cleanse me for whatever shortcomings are in my life. Lord, I need you. But I'm grateful to God today that you're here and I'm grateful to God that you're tuned in to be able to hear what God would say to us today. Our scriptural text today comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2 through 7. Notice here the word of the Lord. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ Give you grace and peace. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. We are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. I'm thinking today simply from the topic, God cares. God cares. God cares. The Apostle Paul here writing to the church at Corinth, because Corinth was a very carnal church, but they were spiritually gifted but yet carnal, spiritually gifted, yet carnal. Uh, remember, he, as he opens up here in 2 Corinthians, this is the second letter that he writes here to the church at Corinth, and this is to the various churches that were located at Corinth. He begins by telling them, may the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Remember, until you have experienced grace, there will be no peace. Until you have grace in your heart, there will be no peace in your heart. Until you have grace in your marriage, there's no peace in your marriage. Until you have grace on your job, there's no peace on your job. There must be grace before there can be peace. And then I want you to understand this principle, that God has graced you for the adversity that is on your journey. The trouble that you will go through, God has graced you. Uh... I mean, life ain't no crystal stair. Life is not a rose garden. Uh, every rose has thorns that come along with it. So along with the beauty, there's also a thorny element. In the beauty of the feathers of the glorious peacock, you look down at the feet of the peacock and they're rusty. In the midst of something beautiful, there is something dusty something rusty, something thorny. So God has graced you for all of the adversity that you will ever encounter on your journey. Don't be dismayed by the trouble that you find on your journey. Don't be discouraged by the struggle that you find on your journey. You're graced for the adversity that's on your journey. And although uncomfortable, adversity helps to promote some positive things in us. Uh, when you go through adversity, it helps to promote growth in us. From that, you also develop life lessons. 
You will get dependence on God. You go through enough trouble, it presses you to pray. You'll be de dependent upon God. When you go through adversity, it builds strength in you. It is not until you have resistance in your life. Resistance builds strength. Resistance builds strength. It then also brings maturity in you. There are some people that are immature and childish in their behaviors until they've gone through adversity, until life knocks them upside the head. Then they'll start maturing and understand what mama and daddy were trying to teach them. So the adversity gives us a gift of maturity. It helps us also with humility. Sometimes until you have gone through some trouble, you are arrogant, a know-it-all, and now the adversity of life has brought humility in us. It also brings for us an empathy for others. An empathy for others. It's not until you've had a hard time that now it gives you a heart for other people that have had a hard time. If, if you've never had to deal with struggling for clothing your children and providing food or trying to pay tuition, then it, it, it gives you a heart for other people. It gives us empathy for others. And then I love this part. When you go through adversity, it gives you a God-glorifying testimony. I mean, if you didn't have a problem, you wouldn't know God could solve it. You'd never know what faith in his word could do. But I'm so grateful to God that through adversity, you get a God-glorifying testimony. That there was trouble, there was adversity, but God delivered you out of it all. That's the way that God is. And uh, for some reason, I don't know why we falsely assume that when we give our lives to Jesus, that we will just somehow magically live happily ever after. Well, wake up to the real world. Uh, because it seems as though we erroneously equate God caring for us with his not ever allowing anything bad to happen to us. No, 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 God cares deeply for us, even in the midst of negative things that happen to us. Even through the struggles and the challenges and the adversity that we go through, God still cares. But some naive thinking, uh, some people believe that when they give their lives to Jesus, that they're not going to have any more trouble. It may be the beginning of trouble for you. Because God's going to work a testimony for your good and for his glory for your good and for his glory. Don't ever forget that. But I want you to understand this, that the bad in others does not hinder the goodness in God. The bad in others does not hinder the goodness in God. Because here's the truth of the matter. Bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to good people people, that's a fact of life. It doesn't, doesn't matter that you pray, that you quote scripture, that you give tithes or offering, bad things happen to good people. It's just a fact of life. But you don't have to let that fact of life become a problem for you. Uh, have you ever noticed the Bible in Psalm 34, 19? Uh, here's what the scripture says to us. Uh, the righteous person faces many troubles uh, but the Lord comes to rescue each time. Oh, King James Version puts it this way. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He also tells us 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. Yeah, he says, yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Not me. This is, this is very, very affirmative. That every person, no matter how good you are, every person who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. They will suffer persecution. And then have you ever noticed uh, St. John chapter 16 verse 33? Notice what Jesus said there. Jesus said, I have told you, uh, told you all that this so that you may have peace in me. Because he says, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. This is Jesus prophesying to us. He says, I want you to have peace in me. Because peace is not the absence of trouble. Peace is the presence of God. Jesus said, I have told you this so that you may have peace in me. Because here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart because I have 
overcome the world. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. You're going to have trials. You're going to have sorrows in this world. People are going to get sick. People are going to die. He says, be of good cheer. I've already overcome the world. Take comfort in the fact that I've overcome the world because I'm a prophetic picture for you of what will happen to you if you believe in me. And so I'm so grateful that God does not merely shield us from trouble, but he grows us through it. He doesn't merely shield us from it. He grows us through it. And I want you to understand this principle that God is much more concerned about your development for the future than your comfort for the moment. That's what God is concerned about. He's concerned about developing you. I, I would screenshot that if I were you so that you have this as a reminder to you when trouble comes that God is much more concerned about your development for the future than your comfort for the moment. And sometimes we start crying and whining and belly aching and mealy mouthing because of the discomfort of the moment, but it is for a greater purpose. If you pay now, you can play later. My God, but if you play now, you're going to pay a whole lot much more for it later. And I just want to encourage you to just trust God. Trust God to work it out for your good and for his glory. Uh, remember Romans 8, 28, all things, all things work together for the good of them that love God, who are the called according to his purpose. You know, you love God if you call according to his purpose. God says, no matter how shady it is and people mistreat you and folks promise things that they don't deliver and people that deceive you and work against you, God says, take it all in stride because I will take all of the things, the good things and the bad, the positives and the negatives, the ups and the downs. And God says, I will, in the midst of all of that, I'll work it together for your good. I'll take your trouble, the bitter and the sweet, and I'll make you some lemonade. I'll work it for your good. <clears throat> I will work it for your good. I'll work it for your good. And when you're really tuned into God, the bitter that the devil brought into your life, mixed with the sweetness of what God does in your life, God says, I will take it and make lemonade for you. But he says, this is not about refreshing you with a glass of lemonade. He said, I've given you a formula so you can sell it. And now you will refresh others with what God says I use to refresh you. Are you listening? I mean, God will give you a formula because if it was good enough to bring you out, is it not also good enough to bring somebody else out? The same scripture that you stand on that brought deliverance to you, that brought peace to you, that got you filled with the Holy Ghost. Cannot you trust God that that same truth is good enough for your boss, your co-worker? Your neighbor, your son, your daughter, your niece, your nephew, your cousin, your grandmother, your grandfather? Is anything really too hard for God? God cares. God cares. God cares. You can go through so much stuff and you can wonder, you know, God, I'm, I'm in this all alone and nobody's over here to help me, Jesus. I got all these children. Everybody, time I see you, somebody, time I, they calling my phone. I got to pay a bill. Somebody want to borrow some more money. And when is somebody going to come and see about me? But I want to let you know that even when you feel like nobody cares, God cares. God cares. Even though you're hurting, God cares. God cares. You can't assume that, I mean, wouldn't it be crazy if a child were hurt and the mother is trying to comfort the child that because the child is still hurting that the mother doesn't care? The mother does care. And it hurts the mother to see her child hurt. It hurts God to see his children hurt. He allows us to hurt, but God then brings healing. He cures us. He delivers us. He brings you through. God cares. 1 Peter 5, 7 reminds us of this. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Give it to God. I want you to see that real carefully. Let that soak in. Instead of you're just reading other stuff and listening to the lyrics of songs that bring no life to you, you ought to meditate on 1 Peter 5, 7. Give all your worries and cares to God. All your worries, your anxieties, your stresses, your cares to God. Why? Because he cares about you. Give it to God. Now listen. 
Giving it to God is not a one-time thing. I want you to hear me very carefully. Because you're talking, uh, someone is talking to you now who has walked through this experientially. When you give it to God in prayer, you know, it's like, Lord, I give these children to you. Lord, I give my spouse to you. Lord, I give this to you. I'm this stuff on my job. I give you these bills. Lord, I give you this. I realize that when you get up off of your knees, these thoughts come back to your mind. And, and you said, no, no, I, I thought I gave it to you. You have to keep giving it to them. Every time you think about it, you got to then remind the devil, devil, I gave that to God while I prayed. And right now I am thanking him that God heard me because God cares for me and God is working it out on my behalf. I distinctly remember giving that over to God. And so devil, if you want to talk about that, you got to talk to God because I gave that to him. You have to keep doing it. It's an ongoing process that every time the thought of it comes back to your mind again, rem remind the devil, I gave that to God. I gave that to God. Every time, you know, you can forgive a person and then you think about what they did to you. You can get angry all over again. Forgiveness is a process. You have to uh, forgive every time that the devil brings the offense up that angered you the first time. When you think about it, you can just think about it. That, that dude ain't paid me my money back yet. And you get mad all over again because you just think about the fact that they borrowed money from you and they didn't pay it back. And if you just, I mean, you forgave it. Okay, you forgave it. But then you see them somewhere. You see them on social media and they all balling and out to dinner, eating the lobster tails and, and they owe you money. And, and, and you know the devil said, you know, I know this ain't this dude that, and you see them highballing out in social media and they haven't paid you back and it makes you feel some kind of way you get into your feelings and, and you have to remind the devil I've already forgiven that I've let that go I have no expectations toward that it, it doesn't mean that the person gets by it means that I have returned the judgment of that thing over to God is in his hands now it's in a higher court now and so that's why he says Give all of your, your, your cares, your worries to God because he cares for you. He cares about you. God cares about you. And what hurts you hurts him. God cares. Cast all of your cares and your worries on him because God cares about you. And you know, as much as mothers love their children, particularly their young children that they are breastfeeding, do you know that there are still some mothers that are negligent? It baffles me every time I read a story about how a woman has abandoned her child. I'm like, how can you do that? Is that not antithetical to the very nurturing nature of a mother? But yet we read stories of where some child has been left in a dumpster or on a, you know, a doorstep somewhere. They have just abandoned their children or some mother that doesn't feed her children. And you wonder how on earth can this happen? But I want you to know God cares. Have you ever noticed a scripture here? Isaiah chapter 49 verse 15. Notice this. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? He says, though she may forget, I will not forget you. And so God says, even though there are some bad mothers who forget their children, God says, I will never forget you. If you've been forgotten by a mother, by a father, by a foster care parent, if you've been forgotten by an adoptive parent and abused or neglected, God says, I still care about you. I still care about you. I will not neglect you. I will not forget you. And because God cares, he develops us. Because God cares, he rescues us. Because God cares, he protects us. Because God cares, he comforts us. Because God cares, he heals us. And because God cares, he teaches us to have empathy for others. Because God cares. Because God cares, he develops us. He rescues us. He protects us. He comforts us. He heals us. And he teaches us to have empathy for others. God has called us, and this is why he's telling us here in 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians 1, He's letting us know that the very comfort that I have brought to you, you're supposed to give to other hurting people who are disturbed. This is called the ministry of consolation. 
you have not only been called to the ministry of reconciliation, whereby we reconcile the world back to God, we've also been called to a ministry of consolation. The ministry of consolation is where we then give to people comfort. You give to them encouragement, and then you give to them cheer. The ministry of consolation. It is giving comfort and encouragement and cheer. That's the ministry of consolation. We're called to that. So when you find hurting people, you comfort them. You encourage them. You cheer them up. It's amazing how God has given us the ministry of consolation. If you made it through, you ought to take the cheer and the confidence that you know that God can bring you out of this thing because if you'll be honest with yourself, you were in trouble. You were in a bad fix where you didn't think that you'd ever get out. But God brought you out. There are some things that can happen to you that so stun you that you wonder, God, how can I ever go on from here? My life is over. And yet God helps you to live another day. And sometimes when you're in a deep, deep trial, you can't even see for next year. It's God to help me to get through the next five minutes. Help me, God, to get through the next hour. Sometimes certain events can happen in life that are so shocking to you. The, the, the idea is just, God, help me to sleep through the night. If I could just make it through the night, you know, you get, you get your imagination goes wild in the night. Your thoughts of anxiety. You, you, you can have panic attacks and, and you can wonder, you can feel overwhelmed and and you're just asking God, God, just give me, give me, give me enough, God, so that I can go to sleep. And you're trying to just get through the next five minutes, the next hour, the next day, the next week, the next month. And finally, like a baby learning to walk, their muscles are building day by day, even when you don't see the muscles de developing. But their muscles, they're developing a little more strength every day. Every time they feed, they're developing a little more strength. So even when you read the word and when you pray and you don't see anything happening, you're developing a little more strength to be able to walk out of this thing. God's going to build you up. He's going to edify you. He's going to comfort you. He's going to develop you and strengthen you and make you a blessing to somebody else who's going through a similar kind of a stunning event in their life that has paralyzed them, and then you become the prophetic evidence that you will live again. You will walk again. You will love again. You will teach again. My gift that's in you will flow out of your life once again. You're not going to die because something that you love died. Somebody that you love died. We have to become, as it were, a Barnabas. The, word, the name Barnabas means son of encouragement, son of encouragement. When it said that he's a son of encouragement, that tells me that he had encouraging parents. That means that his parents were incredible encouragers, incredible encouragers. And, and you see, here's the principle. We learn what we live. We learn what we live. Because if a child lives with criticism, he or she learns to be critical. But if a child lives with praise, he or she learns to be grateful and commending of other people. If a child lives with encouragement, he or she learns to encourage. You learn what you live. You learn what you live. That's why the home is the first institution of learning. The home. Not, not homeschooling, not, not public education. The home is the first institution of learning. And when you begin to realize that every person, every person in the world, no matter how much money they have, no matter how famous they are, no matter how many accomplishments are to their credit, every human being on the planet has an emotional need to feel loved, to be understood, to be valued, and to be remembered. Every human being on the face of the planet has an inner need to be loved, to be understood. I cannot tell you in the number of marriages that I've counseled over the years, and it's like, well, I just wish that I had somebody to understand me. 
They just want to be heard so that they can be understood. We have a need to be understood. Something is comfort, comforting to us when we are understood. We have a need in us to be loved, to be understood, to be valued, and to be remembered. I never forget a number of years ago, I was visiting St. Jude's Children's Hospital, and there was a little girl that was there, and they'd ask her, who was dying with cancer, are you, are you afraid of dying? This seven-year-old girl said, no, I'm not afraid of dying. She said, I'm afraid of not being remembered. She wanted to be remembered. That when I leave this earth, is anybody going to ever remember that I was even here? She wanted to be remembered. We have a need to be loved, to be understood, to be valued, and to be remembered. Just think that every person that you meet, even if it's somebody that comes to your house to do service, that person needs to be loved, to be understood, to be valued, and to be remembered. Even the, the, the cashier that is slow, when there are 10 registers and only one is open. That cashier needs to be loved, to be understood. Can you imagine how frustrating it is to that one cashier? Wondering why they have not paid some other people to come here and now they got all these folks mad at you? And now you stress it, can you? I understand them. I, I used to run a cash register in a retail store. I, underst I understand, I understand. I, I never forget, I was in the grocery store one time, and, and uh, there were so many people there, and, uh, and I could tell that this, this woman was, was frustrated, and, 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 and I looked at her, and, and I said, I said, just, just exhale, just, just relax, just, just relax. And the moment I said that to her, she just broke down in tears. She just started crying like a baby, and I'm like, oh my God, oh, a, a spill on aisle seven, spill on aisle seven. <laughs> she's a human being that just needed to be understood she's not a computer and she's dealing with the attitude of some people that can be nasty and cantankerous and unrelenting and unthankful and you're there and you're tired and you're weary and you've got your own set of problems at home this is a human being that needs to be loved, to be understood, to be valued, to be remembered. I wish that people would remember this when they say nasty things and post nasty comments on somebody's social media. This is a human being that needs to be loved, understood, valued, and remembered. Listen, we the people of God have to be better than what the folks in the world are doing. I expect that out of the world. I really do. But the mean-spiritedness, listen, that I've seen out of some people that name the name of Jesus Christ, it becomes a shame to the character of Christ when we are so uh, attacking of people in this mob violence of anonymity that, and this boldness that a computer screen and a, and, a, and a keypad gives us. So just remember, whether you're in person with a person, they still need to be loved, understood, valued. And remembered because God has given us a ministry of consolation whereby we bring comfort encouragement and cheer to others comfort encouragement and cheer to others and I'm grateful for that I'm so grateful for that I've been an encourager all of my life all of my life. I mean when I was a teenager one of the first things that happened to me when I was filled with the Holy Ghost at 14 uh, is that I began writing prophetic letters to people encouraging them in the Lord. I realized, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3, He that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. It is prophetic to actually bring comfort in the lives of people, encouragement, cheer. So it's a ministry empowered by the Holy Ghost. 
There's enough negativity in our world already. Let him use you to speak life, to bring life, to bring encouragement, cheer, and comfort into the lives of others. But I want you to know that God cares for you. God sees you individually. He doesn't see a mob. God sees you. He doesn't see a crowd. God sees you. He doesn't see a big family. God sees you. He sees the individual. I want you to notice this passage of scripture in St. John chapter 8 and verse 1 because it has a message to us. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple, and a crowd soon gathered and he sat down and taught them. And as he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery, and they put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. Some theologians said that he was perhaps writing the sins of those who were standing there with the stones. And, and uh, they kept demanding an answer. And so he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. And when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. And then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Now, here's what I want you to see. Is that God's opinion of you is never formed by popular opinion. God's opinion of you is never formed by popular opinion. The whole crowd was against this woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And, it, and it, doesn't it show the unfairness of the society that would bring just the woman? She was caught with somebody. And they, where's her partner in crime? And here now, they, they've accused this woman and the whole mob is ready to stone her and bring her to death. And I want you to realize here that sometimes in order to understand the nature of something, you have to first define what it is not before you define what it is so that you really understand the nature of it. And I want you to understand here what Jesus did and, uh, and what he did not do. Let's look at what he didn't do and then we'll look at what he, what he did do. Number one, Jesus did not condemn the woman. She's caught in the act of adultery. Jesus did not condemn her. I want you to notice that what he didn't do, he didn't condemn her. But secondly, I want you to understand this. Jesus also did not condone her. Just because you condemn, uh, don't condemn something does not mean that you, don't, that you condone it. He did not condone her actions. He didn't condone it. He didn't say that what you did was right. He did not condemn her, but he also did not condone her. But I want you to see here what Jesus did with this woman. Jesus confronted her. She's already brought in the mob here, and they, they say, hey, 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 look, look, look here, look, look here, look here, look here. And isn't it amazing that all of the accusers that brings her in public and publicly shames her. And then Jesus shamed the shamers by saying, let the one who's without sin cast the first stone. And they begin to drop their stones from the oldest person to the youngest person. And then she was left there alone with Jesus. Now, 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 now here's, here's how people are. Isn't it amazing? How when you mess up, it's in the public, and they publicly shame and humiliate you. But her forgiveness and restoration happened in private after the crowd had left, and they didn't know what Jesus had done. Can you imagine them saying, hey, 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 aren't you the woman? I remember you. 
you were a woman, you, you, they, they dragged you out naked and you, you were, you, you, yeah, yeah, I, I remember you. But they didn't remember the process of cleansing and restoration that happened in their life because they were gone then. People see your, your fails, failures, but they don't see your restoration. They don't see your forgiveness. They don't see your contrition. They don't see your brokenness of heart. And I want you to see what Jesus did. Jesus, he didn't condemn the woman, but he didn't condone her. But I want to show you what he did do. Jesus confronted her. Number one, he confronted the woman. He's dealing with her head on. He confronted her. Woman, where are your accusers? He confronted her. But then he covered her. He covered her. He covered her. He covered her. So, hey, hey, hey. When he, covering protects. Covering protects. That's the difference between a lid and a covering. A lid limits, but a cover protects. Jesus covered the woman and protected her from the crowd that was about to stone her and kill her. Jesus covered her. He confronted her, and then secondly, he covered her. Jesus covered her. Jesus covered her. And then Jesus corrected her. I want you to see what he did. He confronted her. He covered her in love. But then he corrected her. Because he said, go and sin no more. What you did wasn't right. I want you to, to say, realize there's a better way. He confronted her. He covered her. He corrected her. And then fourthly, he charged her. He charged her. After he had forgiven her, he charged the woman to change her conduct. Go and sin no more. Stop the sin. Jesus loved her, never condemned her, never condoned it, but he confronted it and he covered her and he corrected her and he charged her. Go and sin no more. When Jesus finds us, he doesn't condemn us, nor does he condone our wrong. But he confronts us by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He confronts us. But he covers us by his blood. And he corrects us. Corrects us. And then he charges us. Start doing something different. And I believe that when he begins to charge the woman, go and sin no more, that it was a real a, a charge for her to ask this question. Whenever you get ready to participate in an activity, a thought or deed, ask yourself, does this thought, does this deed, does this action move me closer to the destiny of what God has called me to be? Because you have to judge where you're going by what you're doing in the moment. And when we do that, we find a restoration that comes by the power of Jesus Christ. He loves us. And I would say to you, don't let your current position determine your collective possibility. Because God has, he has a destiny for you. And had this woman who was caught in adultery allowed her current position to define her collective possibility, she made it in Scripture. And let me tell you this because I've seen this in the realm of the Spirit. One of the great ploys of the enemy today, and I want you to hear this with prophetic ears. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25, God brought these words to me that he will defy the Most High God. Talking about the enemy that comes against you in your life. And wear down the saints. There's a ploy of the devil to try to wear down the saints with persecution. And he will try to change all laws, morals, and customs. Sound familiar? God's people will be helpless in the hands for three and a half years. But I want you to know that he has not left us as those who have no hope. I'm a watchman on the wall and my prophetic ears are open to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. And there is a demonic ploy to try 
to wear down the saints. When you wear down the saints, you weaken their convictions. You desensitize them so that things that they know are not right, they find themselves living in defiance of God because they've been worn down by the enemy. Worn down by looking at too much stuff that is ungodly, listening to too much stuff that's ungodly, doing too much stuff that is ungodly, and they have seared their consciousness, and they've been worn down by the enemy, just worn down. Whenever you get tired, your strength to resist leaves. But God cares. He's wearying the saints. It's an old strategy of the devil is to try to wear down the saints, to try to make them give up. But may I tell you this, that just because you feel depleted does not mean that you are defeated. Can I remind you of this? That just because you've been worn down and you feel weary just because you are fatigued does not mean you're finished I pray that you hear with prophetic ears today some of you the devil has just worn you down rise with new strength be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might Look within and find the strength of the word that is in your own spirit. That strength will rise up in you to guard against the weariness of the flesh. May I remind you that as the ploy of the enemy is to wear down the saints, God already knew of the devil's devices to wear you down with debt and stress and worry and the cares of this world and things happening in your marriage and things happening to your children and with your finances and in your health and in your, in your thinking, in your mind and on your job and in your whole family situation. He knew about all of these things that were just wearing you down because you were buffeted, given one blow after another, after another, after another, after another, after another, and you're worn down. And you don't even resemble a soldier in the army of the Lord. But he reminds us in Isaiah chapter 40, he gives strength to the weary and he increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those <laughs> that hope in the Lord or wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings, soar with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. God already saw. <laughs> he already saw it and said that if you'll wait in my presence, if you'll wait on me, and when he says wait on me, this is not a passive waiting like standing back and waiting on the bus to come. This is the waiting that is the word that is used when you're in a, in, a, in a restaurant and they're serving while you wait. May I get something else for you, Lord? How is it, God, that I might be an encouragement to somebody else? I know that I've got my own issues, but can I serve you? Whatever, and I busy myself. And the more that I walk and serve him while I'm waiting on my breakthrough, I keep on serving. I keep on serving. I keep on giving. I keep on praying. I keep on blessing. I keep on prophesying. I keep on encouraging somebody else. Even though I'm dealing with my own stuff. They that wait. They that wait. They that wait. They that wait. They are building themselves up on their most holy faith. And there is a power. Power of the Holy Ghost. That is building up in you a strength. 
a strength that is not of you, but it is to you and then through you. There is a strength that comes to the people of God. Wait on Him because He cares and He provides for you. I pray that you've gotten something from the Word of the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.